Welcome to Kinship Birth Connections. I'm your host, Lauren Archer. In today's video, you'll meet Benjamin Bingham, the author of Making Money Matter, Impact Investing to Change the World. The way we think about money has extraordinary impact. Benjamin's approach considers the perspective of the threefold social order as defined by Rudolf Steiner, which distinguishes three realms of society. The economic realm, which includes business, commerce, and markets. The political realm, which includes politics, law, and human rights. And the cultural realm, which includes science, education, arts, religion, and media. Benjamin is a social entrepreneur, investor, certified financial planner, and registered investment advisor. He founded Three Sisters Sustainable Management, which manages his portfolio called Scarab Funds. He was educated at Yale University and Emerson College in England, where he was certified in biodynamic agriculture. Benjamin is also a fellow of Economists for Peace and Security, a member of the Investor Circle and the Social Venture Network, and serves on the board of the Mariah Fenton Gladys Foundation and the CSR Hub. He co-founded a nonprofit community campus for young adults with learning differences and two technology startups, one in biohealth and the other a global workflow solution provider. Without further ado, let's welcome Benjamin Bingham. So thank you for joining us, Benjamin. Uh, tell me a little bit about your background and how you got involved in KINS and your connection with Susan. Actually, my connection to Susan is, um, I wasn't conscious of it first, but um, her father made these really wonderful tennis rackets. And I was a I was a sanctioned tennis player. I, at one point, won the New England championships in doubles when I was 16. And my father always got tennis rackets from Susan's father. Go he, figure. Did you, and a, you, did you know that then? Or was that something you found out later? I don't know if I ever saw Susan in the, in that interaction, but my father uh, bought uh, Davis tennis rackets from Susan Davis's father, um, and Bancroft as well. Uh, I think he produced as and many things that he produced um, that were related to my father's invention, which was a small um, gymnasium that anyone could have on their you know in their yard or on the side of a building or on the roof of a building that was a place where you could get a lot of exercise in a small space. Wow. And Susan's father made sawed off rackets for him. Um, so you could play um, a form of, um, you know, uh, racquetball and against a rebound net that my father invented. <laughs> so anyway, it's just funny because it was, you know, right back to it, you know, and then I, the next time I met her, uh, again, it was just on the phone, but in 1993, um, my brother was one of the founders or one of the very early uh, members of Investor Circle, which Susan started. And he gave me, he wasn't supposed to hand out the directory to other people, but he gave one to me. And I was raising money in the early 90s for a um, biological healthcare company that never made it too far because it had... Um, it actually had cures for things and people don't want to invest in cures. They want to invest in things that are, have repeat business. So it wasn't a successful uh, project, but um, in the process, I got to meet a lot of wonderful people, uh, including Susan. And then in, I didn't really see her, but I got to know in the interim, her, her current husband, who is a biodynamic farmer. So I had left Yale um, in 1970, um, took a leave of absence when all the student unrest was going on and I wanted a clear answer. Um, I just didn't have a clear answer. What was, well, what was I supposed to say to people picketing when I went into a class and saying, I'm wasting my time going to art history or philosophy. I should be out helping people. And I didn't have an answer. I was against the Vietnam War and I went to England and learned about my father's philosophy, which was anthroposophy. And there I learned about the threefold social order, which, which we can talk about. But 
Uh, I also learned uh, how to farm biodynamically. I spent two years there and then farmed all over Europe for a few months and then came back and took over the family farm where I had grown up in Connecticut. So I was milking 100 cows uh, when I was 22, all by myself every day for a period of time. And Susan's husband was doing the same thing. So I later met him through the biodynamic movement and through Camp Hill, uh, which is a um, a worldwide movement of communities, intentional communities, really using the threefold social order ideas to form, you know, an, a healthy organism. Um, which, and and I'd love to say more about that, but it, it just so wonderful when I later met. Uh, Susan and he she was I was struck when she got up on the stage the night before 9-11 and she doesn't really remember this when I when I reminded her it was the first time I ever heard someone say it's not the double bottom line it's the triple bottom line she was in front of the audience of the SRI in the Rockies you know SRI meaning socially responsible investing conference it was in phoenix arizona and it was the night before 9 11 so it really stuck in my mind she 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 was saying let's talk about people planet and profit and i'd never heard anyone i don't i don't know if she invented that but it was very very early and people were talking about a double bottom line sort of you know financial and social and she changed it into a triple bottom line. And, you know, there's, it's not that often used anymore. And I think it's really important that you consider the three. It's really a threefold idea. Um, and now it's ESG, which is three, but actually governance. It's e- environmental, social, and governance. Governance, I think, was invented by people who wanted to do consulting because it was another way that you could look at the social aspect of a company. So you really, it's twofold, two times social, really. It's not really another aspect, I think. If you're really looking at the social aspect, it's governance is important. Um, But it took out profit from that that picture that she uh, made me aware of when she stood up that day. The next day, the airplanes hit the, uh, the, the towers and um, the conference was changed into a, a meeting of people who cared for each other. Some were grieving the loss of loved ones. And a group of us um, actually um, put a, put a uh, chartered bus together to because the airplanes weren't flying to get back to the East Coast. So there's a lot of bonding that went on there. It sounds like it. It's yeah. amazing the way though that your circles intertwined that uh, mm-hmm. it started sort of with a connection in business uh, between your two fathers who were both, you know, innovative business people. Um, yeah. And and then you at Yale, and then you did the, the digression into biodynamics and farming, connecting with Walter ultimately through that, and then circling back to socially responsible investing. Um, what a story. Yeah, I've heard Walter talk about the threefold social order as that's part of the anthroposophical movement. And mm-hmm. I, I heard the points and they sound very reasonable, but I don't fully understand it. So I grew up outside of Chicago in a blue collar neighborhood, you know, um, mainstream education. So all of those ideas were quite foreign to me. So I would love to have you explain the essence because um, with your uh, socially responsible investing uh, portfolio, you believe that this this threefold social order is a, a philosophy that most of us should follow. Is that right? I think we already are, but we just don't know it. So it's not actually <laughs> as far fetched as it might sound. And, you know, it, it sounds ancient, you know, from a hundred years ago, Rudolf Steiner was, was um, asked by leader, the leaders who were going to represent the European countries in, in the Versailles Treaty, 
after World War I. And actually, he was well known enough that he was asked to formulate a proposal for reorganizing Europe. And right, you know, now looking back, you know, Rudolf Steiner, he because he did so many different things, including biodynamics and Waldorf education. And he, you know, the RSF social finance is fairly well known based on his ideas. And, and Triado, Triados Bank is one of the most uh, well-known community banks and in, in global, uh, you know, socially conscious bank um, based on Steiner's ideas. But um, he's also an esoteric teacher, you know, who was involved in theosophy and then transforming theosophy into a Western focused, um, you know, spiritual path. So he was such a broad thinker that some people just can't, you know, we're so into specializing. So, we can, you know, I, I know people, I've, you know, I went back to Yale and met with one of my professors and he happened to be from Germany and he hated Steiner because Steiner seemed to think he knew everything about everything. <laughs> but actually Steiner was just somebody who, who had, um, uh, wisdom and he was only uh, really answered questions that people asked him and then he would give courses and that would give indications so he wasn't a micromanager he had a lot of simple ideas that people could pick up on or not and develop or not and a lot of them have been developed and he's not often credited for it and sometimes people maybe not even conscious that the ideas may have been first um voiced by him. So the threefold social order, he wrote a book um, and the group was not allowed or was somehow railroaded and it didn't uh, get to present the proposal at this at Versailles. And uh, maybe the time wasn't right for it. You know, uh, Wilson did rail his group uh, representing um, Woodrow Wilson railroaded through the what are called the 14 points which i think are the reason we've had nothing but war and, and enmity around the world ever since because it's it it takes one ideal which is liberty and it takes that and applies it to everything in the, the 14 points it keeps bringing it up and what it really means is it gives liberty to to corporations to do whatever they want in a way. And, over, and, and it, in the cultures of Europe were kind of fenced in. They drew the map around culture. So it divided the countries up into cultures. It didn't have an awareness of ecological regions and things like that. So people, you know, had no, you know, they didn't have access to water. They didn't have access to things they had to fight over to get. And the threefold social order was, was such a simple framework. It's got a lot of very, um, very clever uh, uh, ideas that, that go along with it. But the basic idea is to take the, the ideals of the French Revolution and apply them where they actually are the most helpful. And you know, we all know liberté, égalité, fraternité, it's, you know, famous, but we also know that it was chaos, that that revolution was not nice. People were cutting each other's heads off in the name of ideals. And so, you know, people think, well, these are great ideals and you can rouse people up talking about them as a politician. But what Steiner's unique uh, idea was apply freedom, liberty to culture. So science, art, religion, education, individuality, expression, you know, how we express ourselves, all of those things as much as possible should be under the banner of freedom. So we can look at what's going on in the world today and we have all of the research for medicine and science is is paid for by big corporations and government in you know in, in you know combination. So you have the other two spheres, not the cultural sphere. You have the political and the and the economic spheres dictating what 
is supposed to be taught in the schools, what research should get funded, and all sorts of things that are leading to all kinds of problems. The second you know, ideal of equality is, is the, it's really what should rule over or it's most healthy if, it, if it's the flag under which all political striving, all governance, um, all rights should, should go under. So if you imagine, I mean, Steiner said, this will probably take a long period of time for us to, to wean ourselves of the idea of nation states. Um, but really, um, governments should become smaller and smaller because we, you know, his ideal of, for government was really individual, um, a kind of anarchy, but he called it, um, you know, um, conscientious, no, ethical, we call it ethical individualism. If you have ethical individuals in a society, then you don't really need people telling you what to do. And um, so the government should be about infrastructure, about making things fair, about making things equal so that people have equal access to things. And, and you know, for example, schools could be funded in terms of infrastructure by by somebody who would collect money on behalf of, of, of the political realm. But the curriculum should be completely free. So you could have all kinds of diverse approaches to learning and people could have a lot of choice as to where they would send their children or where they would develop their uh, future um, more, more developed, um, you know, when they higher education. If they want to study something, they should be able to. It shouldn't have, the government should have no say over it. And he was opposed to, um, you know, he was, uh, you know, believed in uh, this separation of church and state and, and that national government shouldn't be tied to a religion because it, it automatically makes the people that are not members of that religion or have different beliefs um, less, less than and, and um, prejudiced against. So it's a very simple idea. Just think of equality when you're talking governance, when you're talking about, you know, access to things. It's very simple. And then the, the third ideal that works best in the, in the, it works best in the economic realm is, is fraternity. That's a male word we're always looking for the best word to replace it it might be reciprocity it might be um altruism it might be all kinds of different there's many words community um but basically reciprocal um, mutuality you know collaboration all of these things um have to do with fraternity and he what he was saying is that that is the purpose of business Business is really just about taking care of people's needs. And so, you know, then, you know, you can build from there. But those simple ideas, you know, are very powerful. And you so can, can you name them again. What are the three? The three uh, fold social order is liberty, equality, and then fraternity. Yeah. yeah. So in the French Revolution, those were the words, but it went chaotic because because instead of liberty in the cultural realm where science, art, religion, education, and all these kinds of things were about individual development um, was ruled by, by economics and by political interests instead of by this ideal of freedom. And I think it's interesting. I heard you say the cultural realm. So there's like these different spheres or realms that, uh, that, Steiner and this philosophy embodies. Can you tell me yeah. a little bit more about that from someone who you know, sure. is looking at it from the outside? What, That's what would I, yeah. what do we mean? This so one of the reasons I said, it's not really a matter of imposing anything is we already have it inherently in, in society is because we have, we think we feel and we do. That's something we, you know, we all have that threefold 
quality and the cultural realm is more connected to the head and to the individuality when you see someone's face you see who they are you know their body can be many different ways you may be surprised when you actually meet them after only seeing them on zoom their body might be quite different but you know their character from their face and their head and that's the cultural aspect the heart realm the breathing and the in the circulation is the feeling realm and and it's also the realm that where we are equal we can have a feeling for each other we have a a heart for each other for humanity and everyone and you know this may sound like um i don't know i'm concerned about some of the language now that's related to you know i i you know you have to be um an anti-racist now and i am an anti-racist i've always been anti-racism but um you know it's to some of the language that i've heard would say that it's it might be racist to say we're all equal or it might be racist to say we're um that individuality is important um i don't know i'm a little bit confused by some of the language but i think this is simpler it's, it it is where we all are equal we all have hearts we all have feelings we all breathe and have a heartbeat even though our thoughts may be totally different and then the the third aspect of society is what we do is the economic realm so it's it's um, what we do with our hands and our legs but you know um it's represented already in in the human body so it's very um it's very easy to relate to at least for me but i've been thinking about it for 50 years so I, it's helpful to have someone ask questions yeah absolutely well so how is that different then uh than what we have now so if you know you look at this model of this ideal uh the threefold social order it sounds to me it's it sounds very simple and why wouldn't we all agree on it so how is that different than what you're witnessing in our structures that are set up now well i mean you 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 know one of the things in the racism question is is systematic racism what is that that's just the opposite of equality in how things are structured you know the the laws um systematically separated um races the laws in europe separated cultures put fences around countries they weren't about equality people didn't have the equal access to resources uh, um that they should instead they implemented freedom to corporations so now you have corporations controlling resources around the the world that's not right it should be all equal so um that doesn't mean that um everybody should have the same amount of money because that's that would be applying equality to the economic sphere and and so you would get real confusion there because people are not necessarily equal people have in in that realm in what they do or in what they think or how they think what they're capable of of creating is different people have different uh, capacities much of it is imposed by the systematic racism and other things that imposes uh, things on our ability to achieve things but the it's important to realize that the equality is something um that's not about culture it's not about um economics it's about the you know the middle realm the heart realm the the political realm the rights realm and so it's an interesting um thing to notice you know what where are things getting out of balance why does this not feel right when i'm in a situation that the wrong ideal is being applied i'm you know you know that i have a difference with people that are libertarian in that re- regard because they believe in in the free market um they they have other beliefs that i might agree with but it's very helpful to have kind of a framework for thinking about it 
So free market is a is just an excuse for for um, gr- you know greediness. It, you know it, it's it's the opposite of altruism or reciprocity. It's you know if you so in that realm, I mean, there are some very clear ideas that Steiner gave that I think uh, could change the world tremendously. One of them being that the leadership of the resources of the of the capital people, you know, the, the capital means, you know, resources, it means money, but it also means buildings and, and you know, the rights to use um, patents, it means equipment, it's stuff like that. The management of resources should be chosen for two things. One, their expertise, that they're the best person to lead a particular initiative. And secondly, they're the best for society. So they they're known to be like in the Kins method, their strategy is generosity. If you have people who are leading corporations whose strategy is generosity, wow, that's so connected with the threefold social order idea of, of fraternity or reciprocity in the economic realm. Also, uh, a lot of original peoples come from that perspective that's uh, taking a look at making sure that the leadership has the good of the whole, the community, seven generations down the line. Yes. And so, uh, yeah, we have fallen quite a ways away from that. Yeah. I mean, America is built on competition and competition, you know, we just love games. We love to compete with each other. <laughs> Love to watch competition. And, you know, I was just listening to something the other day that was saying we're moving towards a society that's like the Hunger Games, where nobody's actually interacting with each other. We're watching everything on television. And, and it's all about, you know, who's going to win the Hunger Games. And it's, it's a scary thought, but um, competition isn't inherently bad. But it actually, it's interesting that it, it belongs more in the cultural realm than it does in the economic realm. We should be competing to become the best that we possibly can be as individuals. We should become as smart as possible. We should become, you know, as, um, I don't know, intuitive and, and creative as possible. And schools should be really encouraging creativity, not um, you know, ability to take tests that somebody who's a bureaucrat designed who isn't creative. <laughs> um, so I want to also bring up the notion of, of I, I think you said it in your 10 year report for Scarab Funds about elevating competition towards everybody competing to create a better world. That's like Buckminster That's exactly. Fuller's notion that it's the world game, right? And we win when it works for everybody. So yeah. how does that fit in with, um, with the threefold social order and Steiner's philosophy? Well, it's, it's interesting. You, it's where it gets a little complicated is each of the spheres also has three aspects to it. So you, it's really ninefold, but and that gets complicated, but it's not that hard to think, you know, if you're running a business and you have a creative person or a group of people that are creative, you don't want to be micromanaging them. You want them to be creative and, and you want to give them freedom to do that. The bottom line is the, the banner over the whole, you know, enterprise is to do good to others. But within that framework, you want to have uh, the, the most creative people competing with each other to find the best solutions. And, and um, you know, the best solution wins. You know, you also want to have within a company, you want to have good governance, you know, which, which represents society as a whole so that you really understand what human needs are out there. You don't want to just have a few, you know, elite people, you know, who have been, you know, um, you have their own uh, idiosyncrasies that you you want to have a mixture that's a good governance you know for for a company so they really are um, relevant in a big way not just to a few or not just to make a lot of money you know 
So making money also is not a bad thing. It's, um, you know, it, you can have a kind of competition to, to be the most efficient as a business with other businesses. So there is, there is that aspect where I think the, the creative aspect of companies is important, but it has to have, you know, if you want a healthy society, it has to have as a, as the, the umbrella over the top, you know, fraternity or, you know, community or um, reciprocity or mutuality or altruism all these different words that have mean we're brothers and sisters here. We're, we're not competing with Mars where we're, it's one planet, you know, and in what, one of, one of the great, I think, ideas of Steiner in talking about the economic sphere, it's in a book called world economics. He gave a course to economic students. It, it, he goes into the idea of association. So instead of, you know, people within an industry competing with each other, they would associate with each other and figure out the best ways to do things, the best ways to meet needs. And they would be, the association would include both producers and consumers. So you get together, you figure out what are the best solutions for the problems the world has right now? And what's the right pricing for it? How could we, it might be different in different areas because you have to ship stuff there to make it happen where over there it already has those materials or whatever. They're different pricing, um, but you doing it in a way that um, is actually trying to get, you know, to get the best results. Um, and that sounds and like what Susan's doing in, uh, or what, that sounds like what Susan has created with her Kins Networks is really getting people who share an idea for, okay, how do we come up with a solution to a particular problem? Let's find people mm -hmm. from different sectors, different right. levels of engagement, different parts of the puzzle. And we <laughs> come together with an idea of collaboration, not competition, yeah. and make it fun. Well, it's fun if it's something that you're doing with love. If you know that the, the people in your group are not out to, to get something from you, uh, but everybody, that spirit of generosity, everybody is contributing towards the greater good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's, it's, it's really not that different from the Kin's ideas. It's just, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of lectures you can read. There's a lot of books you can read and study about it. And some of it seems very old fashioned um, because his examples are, you know, from that time, from, you know, the early 20th century. But it's just as, in fact, I think it's, it's we're really ready for it now. So I'm very excited about what, um, what you're doing and how you want to bring it. Um, yeah, I, I like the idea of the that we're dealing with different spheres because there is so much confusion out there. And when, when you mentioned, you know, people will take an ideal, right? Um, like, li like liberty and they'll get people hyped up about it, but ultimately it can do damage because they're talking about liberty where it should be in one sphere, meaning how you think, uh, how you can be creative education and they're, and they're, applying it in the economic sphere. Is that what I'm hearing? And so that's, that, right. that's where the damage is occurring. So if we get a greater understanding of the different levels and realms and spheres of a being and, and social interaction, that can help clear up some of the confusion. Is that right? Exactly. You know, I think it's, I like the phrase front of mind. I don't remember who started using that, but what's front of mind when you're you know, doing business, it should be, how can I help you? You know, if it, if it's, if you're a politician, you know, a lot of politicians, you know, go around and it's like, how can I help you? And you feel something dirty. You feel like they're just actually just want you to vote for them. <laughs> and um, the point of the of polit politics should be, how can we make this more equal? How can we make things fair? in our world. So everybody has a chance. That's a totally different thing to have front of mind than how can I help you? How can I help you, you know, makes, 
you know, you know, it's it's if you're a if you're a business, you're you might you know you have to have that um, relevance of how I'm helping people. It's not it's not a political thing to get elected. It's it's something like it's a real question. How how can I help you? Um, and in in education, it's you know, of course, teachers who have that helpful attitude are, are the ones you remember and you want to remember, but it sometimes was the ones who were hardest on you, who made you, who create pain, who made you do things you didn't want to do that really helped you the most. So. That um, is so true. <laughs> I bet everybody can remember a, a teacher that pushed them in a way that made them grow. Yeah. So how, and so what would that be then in, in that, in your, in the spheres well, it's challenge. It's cultural. You know, everything educational is cultural. So you know the the culture should be the realm of competition. People are should be trying to learn as much as they can learn, and in, in the way that they want to learn, and in different ways, and find teachers who you know who they can resonate with, who can help them fully um, evolve as an individual. So that's another helpful way to. Think of this is that the cultural realm is mostly about individuals. It's really about individuals and how they, how unique every single individual is in the world. And, and, you know, we all contribute to the whole of humanity without each person, we wouldn't be full. We wouldn't be complete. And the problem is we're squashing individuality in so many different ways and make trying to make everyone more or less the same. And that's not, that's not the right use of equality. Equality is access and it's, um, you know, it's the right to things, but it's not making me the same as you. And so that's, what's wrong in the culture. We're trying to all be past the same tests. Mm. We shouldn't be, we should have all different tests and we should, you know, one of the things I like that it, it's, um, you know, if you think of the cultural aspect of business, so that's where it gets complicated. There is a cultural aspect in every, every business. And what I, I really like, one of the, the words that's become, or one of the frameworks that's become more and more uh, useful is, is KPIs, you know, key um, uh, progress indicators, I think it is, but basically people judging their own um, progress within a company, but always towards, you know, how are we adding value to the umbrella idea, which is to serve in business? You know, who are we serving? How are we serving them best? But there is an individual working in the business who wants to evolve too. And, and, they, and that's the cultural aspect of a business to allow people to, you know, some freedom to evolve, you know, to be educated within the business. So that's where, so you have that big threefold, you know, framework. And then within each um, sphere, you have a threefoldness as well. Um, what I love about that is it's, it sounds like it's a structure that can be adopted because what we're seeing happening now is the, the destruction, the, the breakdown of the existing structures, right? The existing structures are not working. They're based on, on mechanistic thinking. They're mm -hmm. based on um, what was, you know, efficient, like the factory model for production was then installed in education and in so many other things. And so um, here we are faced with this, this massive breakdown on so many levels. And it, it's, going to take a complete shift in thinking, right? Our global systems have to change. And so uh, what I'm hearing you say is Steiner's philosophy, this threefold social order and the multiple tiers of how to envision uh, how we're using ideals and how we're um, relating to each of those realms can provide a new structure that may support this breakdown. We have to, it's like they're happening simultaneously. While one is falling apart, we've got to be ready with another one to, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, to catch it, right? To serve. So um, 
yeah, what do you see as the the next steps or best ways to um, to have people uh, implement that? Obviously, learning about it, but maybe if you have stories of what you're doing in some of your businesses, um, your your portfolio at uh, Scarab Funds is amazing. It looks like you've you've really selected some beautiful businesses that are um, helping the world in so many different ways from from water testing to tree planting to micro lending to so many different things. So curious how you see implementing that on a practical level. Well, I've been doing it for 20 years now and, and um, trying to show people that their whole portfolio, if they have investable assets at all in the first place, um, their whole portfolio can actually be an expression of their highest intention in the world. So that's a starting point. If you want to identify with your own resources that you might've inherited, or maybe it's from the profits from a company or from um, you know, your own initiative, um, how you invest it speaks loudly about who you are. And so I, I set out 20 years ago to try to figure out how can I do that? So I learned the general uh, traditional approach of um, asset allocation and all the things at Lake Mason and Citigroup. And, and when I saw how, you know, how this ideal of fraternity wasn't behind these companies, um, you know, at Citigroup, when I saw <clears throat> that they were manipulating interest rates so that they would make money off of elderly clients of mine who really didn't weren't making a lot of money for Citigroup, but by changing the interest rate that they were getting, the company would get more out of them. Um, when I saw them uh, paying advisors thousands of dollars to write bogus mortgage applications in order to back with paper, um, bogus AAA rated, you know, uh, things they were selling. Um, I just knew that they were not where I could do what I was, what I was set out to do. So I started, uh, I went independent in 2007, took my clients out of the market. So we missed the, tr the crash in 2008. And um, I started investing back into the market, but also doing private investing. Um, so, you know, why be invested in the stock market at all? It seems like a, you know, like a global casino. That's what Hazel Henderson calls it. I'm, I'm in the market because I think it's really interesting to be part of it and, and watch it and maybe have an influence on it so that it becomes what I call a smart mob for human values. You know, that actually the values of companies would be based on on their fraternal or their you know their community orientation to actually take care of human needs and that's the ones that people would value and the people that lead the companies would be the people that help society the most also that do well and are profitable that are efficient and all of that so that you can do well in a market um, investing in good companies so i wanted to show that over time and we've done very well. And we also, you know, I, I apply in the, in the public sphere ideas that maybe are very unusual. So uh, that are based on agriculture. So because I have a background in, you know, 10 years of farming biodynamically, and I've been growing my own biodynamic food for almost 50 years now. Um, I, I, I finally realized that hedging is like in farming, uh, hedging in, 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 tr in trading is similar to hedging in farming because in hedging in, in farming, you're, you're breaking the speed of the wind that's coming into a field and making it go up and over. And so you create a kind of an ecosystem around the field. And I call it the winds of volatility. Volatility is the ups and downs of the market that you're, you can actually put a hedge around um, the values, um, the economic values of your portfolio with, with options. And so we started doing that in 2019 and, and um, it's amazing what's happened. We have much less volatility in our portfolios and yet we've, 
we're way ahead of the market in, in the last, um, since 2019. Um, before that, we were, you know, more or less like the market. So I, was, I wanted to show that you could only own good companies. And I used um, the, and still do very well, it's a matter of good management. Um, more than the actual companies. You can own, uh, you know, you can have a, a different, um, one person can have a very different um, group of companies and do um, just as well as another with a very different group of companies if they manage it well. You know, that's the public market. That's one part of investing. And, and one of the things I learned is that we're all kind of clustered together in the same part of the market when, you know, maybe about 5,000 companies, maybe 8,000 companies at the most that people in general are looking at. When there are actually 80,000 public companies in the world, there are markets around the world. So if we become more global and more connected with one another and more fraternal, more, you know, community oriented, um, I think the other markets will start to grow and not just be Wall Street and the, you know, the, the trading that happens in New York, London, and, um, you know, it's already, it's already changing. So many things are already changing in, in a good direction, becoming more global and more aware. Uh, but the private markets is where you directly impact um, society. When you help a company start from scratch, when you help a company that's been going for a while, but they come to a plateau where they need capital to, to grow, you're really um, making a big difference with a small amount of money sometimes. So yeah, one of the problems we have now is that people are so systematized, they're so mechanized, um, the, the, the stock market is run by computers. People that, if you don't have a supercomputer, your trades will be stolen from you. So it's just making things more and more um, rigid and mechanical and have less and less to do with needing human needs, the valuations. So we need to actually have people push against these supercomputers that are controlling the, the markets with algorithms that have nothing to do with actually what's needed. Pricing should be more and more, um, you know, affected by, you know, what groups of people who care, um, who know, you know, what pricing will work in what regions. Um, these kinds of things can be incorporated into a public market, but in the private market, it's already there. You already know um, the market that you're dealing with. You, you're not just jumbled into a, you know, um, a machine that's, that's saying what your pricing is. Um, so we've, you know, we've been doing uh, private investing and there's issues there that make it, make it difficult. It takes sometimes a long time to come to, uh, you know, the, the point where the investor can get their money back. Um, so there's, there's a lot of innovation that's still needed in, in the private markets um, and the public markets. Um, what I do is um, that's related to the threefold social order is I think about future value having to do with innovation. And that's a cultural thing. So when I think about the, the cycle of economics, um, I think that the, I think of it not in a circle, I think of it in a figure eight. So you have loan money at the beginning of initiative. So we actually do venture debt because we want the entrepreneurs to own their companies. We want them to be, you know, we're investing in them and their mission. So we want them to own as much of it as possible. So venture debt gives them that loan opportunity to get started. And then they start having, you know, over time, some success. And if they're good, they'll, they'll start to be profitable. And, and so you have that exchange money that's, that's Steiner talks about these three kinds of money. So the, 
the loan money, exchange money is at the bottom of this figure eight. And, and that's where real fraternity happens, where you buy from people that you know are fair trade, you know that they're treating their people well, you know that it's not hurting the environment. All of those things, when you transact on that level, you should know all of that. You should be imagining all of that when you go to a store. But anyway, the company comes through that process, hopefully with a profit. I'm not against profit. I'm not, this is not communism we're talking about. And when you get a profit, the question is, what do you do with it? And nowadays, big companies are putting more and more of the profit into the pockets of, of that 1%. And they're not doing what they used to do, even just 20 years ago when I started, um, five or 10% of their profit would go into innovation, into research and development. So it goes up into the cultural realm of you know, individual creativity and thinking about how can we make things better? How can we solve problems? So I like to invest in those companies that are innovative, that have um, this future orientation of making the world better. And um, so those are the three aspects. We, we're, you know, we'd use the threefold to some extent in lending in the middle of that, you know, the beginning of things, trying to lend to companies that are actually going to equalize the world, who are gonna make things better for everybody. You know, the bigger, the better in terms of their potential. So, you know, right now we have a, an innovation. You, see, you can look at my 10-year report on, online on Scarab Funds LLC, and you'll see some, some very cool companies um, that I think are going to make the world better for a lot of people. So what an example of influence, of taking your life, your mission, your values, your creativity, your resources and making the biggest impact and the biggest difference where you can. Benjamin, thank you for all the work that you've done for setting an example for others on how we can use our principles, our philosophy um, and, and our, our innovation, our genius to really put your money where your mouth is, so to speak, and, 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 and have hope for a better future. I think that's so important. And future investors are going to demand that. We are seeing more and more the cascading consequences of what has been uh, the old systems that are breaking down, that aren't working. And so what you've set up is such a beautiful example of how things can be, of a new way of looking at the world. So um, I thank you for sharing your time with us. Um, any, anything, if you had one wish for that people knew more, one, one wish that people could do uh, or closing thoughts that you want to share, what would that be? Well, I have two things I want to say. One is, Kinship might be the right word for the economic realm. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's out of our kinship with each other that we want to help each other and make each other um, take care of our needs, whether we're different or the same. So we're all kins in that regard. So thank you for what you're doing and, and um, the potential, particularly in the economic realm. I think kinship is really, really the right word. And, and, um, important what you're doing in terms of um a last word um i guess i would just say we already know what's right <laughs> you know i think we're we're losing touch with our own common sense and i think we have to start thinking about uh, well you know questioning what's going on in the world, particularly today. Um, I heard someone speak the other day about tyranny. Historically, tyranny can never be um, managed by the small group of people who are in power. So really the power behind tyranny is compliance. It's the people who go along with, with the tyranny. So maybe that's the last word. You could take it as you like. I don't want to get into anything 
you know, controversial, but everything that you do, um, you know, Solzhi Netson said, you know, when he was, people expected him to give a really positive talk about America when he spoke at Harvard in 1969, I think it was, or 68. Um, and what he said was, I was freer in the gulag than I am in this country. And the reason is that there's a tyranny of consensus in this country, and you cannot speak a different point of view, even though you think you have free press and everything. Public opinion is run by consensus. And if we want to have freedom in the future, just maybe take that one idea from the threefold social order. Just think about your culture and don't take away the freedom of others to express themselves um, as they as they like or <clears throat> develop ideas that are different from your own. That's the beauty of this country. That's why it was called the melting pot. I think it should be a salad. We've become too much melted. <laughs> I love that. That's brilliant, a salad. And it brings up more life energy to a melting pot. It's all together. Yes, and that is one of the one of the um, directives we have here at Kinship Earth really is to shine the spotlight on ideas so that um, we can we can have hope that it's not it's not just the one thing that we look at. It's like everything's breaking down. It looks terrible. No, look at all the people in our community alone. And there are more and more communities of change makers and earth advocates that are coming together, sharing ideas. No one person has you know, the, the solution. The solution is all of us coming together and being willing to look at things in a new way and being willing to question and being willing to lend our individual contribution contributions in a way that works for all. So I'm really glad that you um, that you picked up on that notion of kinship. I agree. It's like we're, we're all kindred spirits. We're all earthlings. And so and what we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. Um, so again, thank you for sh you know, sharing your beautiful example of the amazing work you're doing and, um, and for being with us today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Kinship Earth Connections. To learn more about Benjamin Bingham and his work in impact investing, visit www.scarabfundsllc.com. To learn more about Kinship Earth and sign up to attend our live Connections events, please visit us at kinshipearth.org. Thank you.